Mr. Speaker, the pre Members of the Congress, I have the high privilege and distinct honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, distinguished members of the Congress, honored guests, and my fellow Americans. A number of times in past years, members of Congress and a president have come together in meetings like this to resolve a crisis. I have asked for this meeting in the hope that we can prevent one. It would be hard to find many Americans who aren't aware of our stake in the Middle East, the Persian Gulf, or the NATO line dividing the free world from the communist bloc. And the same could be said for Asia. But in spite of, or maybe because of, a flurry of stories about places like Nicaragua and El Salvador, and yes, some concerted propaganda, Many of us find it hard to believe we have a stake in problems involving those countries. Too many have thought of Central America as just that place way down below Mexico that can't possibly constitute a threat to our well-being. And that's why I've asked for this session. Central America's problems do directly affect the security and the well-being of our own people. And Central America is much closer to the United States than many of the world trouble spots that concern us. So, we work to restore our own economy. We cannot afford to lose sight of our neighbors to the south. El Salvador is nearer to Texas than Texas is to Massachusetts. Nicaragua is just as close to Miami, San Antonio, San Diego, and Tucson as those cities are to Washington, where we're gathered tonight. But nearness on the map doesn't even begin to tell the strategic importance of Central America bordering as it does in the Caribbean, our lifeline to the outside world. Two-thirds of all our foreign trade and petroleum pass through the Panama Canal and the Caribbean. In a European crisis, at least half of our supplies for NATO would go through these areas by sea. It's well to remember that in early 1942, a handful of Hitler's submarines sank more tonnage there than in all of the Atlantic Ocean. 
and they did this without a single naval base anywhere in the area. And today the situation is different. Cuba is host to a Soviet combat brigade, a submarine base capable of servicing Soviet submarines and military air bases visited regularly by Soviet military aircraft. Because of its importance, the Caribbean Basin is a magnet for adventurism. We're all aware of the Libyan cargo planes refueling in Brazil a few days ago on their way to deliver medical supplies to Nicaragua. Brazilian authorities discovered the so-called medical supplies were actually munitions and prevented their delivery. You may remember that last month, speaking on national television, I showed an aerial photo of an airfield being built in the island of Grenada. Well, if that airfield had been completed, those planes could have refueled there and completed their journey. If the Nazis during World War II and the Soviets today could recognize the Caribbean and Central America as vital to our interests, shouldn't we also? For several years now, under two administrations, the United States has been increasing its defense of freedom in the Caribbean Basin. And I can tell you tonight, democracy is beginning to take root in El Salvador, which until a short time ago knew only dictatorship. The new government is now delivering on its promises of democracy, reforms, and free elections. It wasn't easy, and there was resistance to many of the attempted reforms with assassinations of some of the reformers. Guerrilla bands and urban terrorists were portrayed in a worldwide propaganda campaign as freedom fighters, representative of the people. Ten days before I came into office, the guerrillas launched what they called a final offensive to overthrow the government. And their radio boasted that our new administration would be too late to prevent their victory. Well, they learned that democracy cannot be so easily defeated. President Carter did not hesitate. He authorized arms and munition to El Salvador. The guerrilla offensive failed, but not America's will. Every president since this country assumed global responsibilities has known that those responsibilities could only be met if we pursued a bipartisan foreign policy. As I said a moment ago, the government of El Salvador has been keeping its promises like the land reform program, which is making thousands of farm tenants farm owners. In a little over three years, 20% of the arable land in El Salvador has been redistributed to more than 450,000 people. That's one in 10 Salvadorans who have benefited directly from this program. El Salvador has continued to strive toward an orderly and democratic society. The government promised free elections. On March 28th, a little more than a year ago, after months of campaigning by a variety of candidates, the suffering people of El Salvador were offered a chance to vote, to choose the kind of government they wanted. And suddenly, the so-called freedom fighters in the hills were exposed for what they really are, a small minority who want power for themselves and their backers, not democracy for the people. The guerrillas threatened death to anyone who voted. They destroyed hundreds of buses and trucks to keep the people from getting to the polling places. Their slogan was brutal, vote today, die tonight. But on election day, an unprecedented 80% of the electorate braved ambush and gunfire and trudged for miles, many of them, to vote for freedom. And that's truly fighting for freedom. We can never turn our backs on that. Members of this Congress who went there as observers told me of a woman who was wind wounded by rifle fire on the way to the polls, who refused to leave the line to have her wound treated until after she had voted. Another woman had been told by the guerrillas that she would be killed when she returned from the polls, and she told the guerrillas, you can kill me, you can kill my family, you can kill my neighbors. You can't kill us all. 
The real freedom fighters of El Salvador turned out to be the people of that country, the young, the old, the in-between, more than a million of them out of a population of less than five million. The world should respect this courage and not allow it to be belittled or forgotten. And again, I say in good conscience, we can never turn our backs on that. The democratic political parties and factions in El Salvador are coming together around the common goal of seeking a political solution to their country's problem. New national elections will be held this year, and they will be open to all political parties. The government has invited the guerrillas to participate in the election and is preparing an amnesty law. The people of El Salvador are earning their freedom, and they deserve our moral and material support to protect it. Yes, there are still major problems regarding human rights, the criminal justice system, and violence against non-combatants. And like the rest of Central America, El Salvador also faces severe economic problems. But in addition to recession depressed prices for major agricultural exports, El Salvador's economy is being deliberately sabotaged. Tonight in El Salvador, because of ruthless guerrilla attacks, much of the fertile land cannot be cultivated. Less than half the rolling stock of the railways remains operational. Bridges, water facilities, telephone and electric systems have been destroyed and damaged. In one 22-month period, there were 5,000 interruptions of electrical power. One region was without electricity for a third of a year. I think Secretary of State Schultz put it very well the other day. Unable to win the free loyalty of El Salvador's people, the guerrillas, he said, are deliberately and systematically depriving them of food, water, transportation, light, sanitation, and jobs. And these are the people who claim they want to help the common people. They don't want elections because they know they'd be defeated. But as the previous election showed, the Salvadoran people's desire for democracy will not be defeated. The guerrillas are not embattled peasants armed with muskets. They're professionals, sometimes with better training and weaponry than the government soldiers. The Salvadoran battalions that have received U.S. training have been conducting themselves well in the battlefield and with the civilian population. But so far, we've only provided enough money to train one Salvadoran soldier out of 10, fewer than the number of guerrillas that are trained by Nicaragua and Cuba. And let me set the record straight on Nicaragua, a country next to El Salvador. 1979, when the new government took over in Nicaragua, after a revolution which overthrew the authoritarian rule of Somoza, everyone hoped for the growth of democracy. We in the United States did too. By January of 1981, our emergency relief and recovery aid to Nicaragua totaled $118 million, more than provided by any other developed country. In fact, in the first two years of Sandinista rule, the United States directly or indirectly sent five times more aid to Nicaragua than it had in the two years prior to the revolution. Can anyone doubt the generosity and the good faith of the American people. These were hardly the actions of a nation implacably hostile to Nicaragua. Yet the government of Nicaragua has treated us as an enemy. It has rejected our repeated peace efforts. It has broken its promises to us, to the organization of American states, and most important of all, to the people of Nicaragua. No sooner was victory achieved than a small clique ousted others who had been part of the revolution from having any voice in the government. Humberto Ortega, the Minister of Defense, declared Marxism-Leninism would be their guide, and so it is. The government of Nicaragua has imposed a new dictatorship. It has refused to hold the elections it promised. It has seized control of most media and subjects all media to heavy prior censorship. It denied the bishops and priests of the Roman Catholic Church the right to say mass on radio during Holy Week. 
It insulted and mocked the Pope. It has driven the Mosquito Indians from their homelands, burning their villages, destroying their crops, and forcing them into involuntary internment camps far from home. It has moved against the private sector and free labor unions. It condoned mob action against Nicaragua's independent Human Rights Commission and drove the director of that commission into exile. In short, after all these acts of repression by the government, is it any wonder that opposition has formed? Contrary to propaganda, the opponents of the Sandinistas are not die-hard supporters of the previous Somoza regime. In fact, many are anti-Somoza heroes and fought beside the Sandinistas to bring down the Somoza government. Now they've been denied any part of the new government because they truly wanted democracy for Nicaragua, and they still do. Others are Mosquito Indians fighting for their homes, their lands, and their lives. The Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua turned out to be just an exchange of one set of autocratic rulers for another, and the people still have no freedom, no democratic rights, and more poverty. Even worse than its predecessor, it is helping Cuba and the Soviets to destabilize our hemisphere. Meanwhile, the government of El Salvador, making every effort to guarantee democracy, free labor unions, freedom of religion, and a free press is under attack by guerrillas dedicated to the same philosophy that prevails in Nicaragua, Cuba, and yes, the Soviet Union. Violence has been Nicaragua's most important export to the world. It is the ultimate in hypocrisy for the unelected Nicaraguan government to charge that we seek their overthrow when they're doing everything they can to bring down the elected government of El Salvador. attacks are directed from a headquarters in Managua, the capital of Nicaragua. But let us be clear as to the American attitude toward the government of Nicaragua. We do not seek its overthrow. Our interest is to ensure that it does not infect its neighbors through the export of subversion and violence. Our purpose, in conformity with American and international law, is to prevent the flow of arms to El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, and Costa Rica. We have attempted to have a dialogue with the government of Nicaragua, but it persists in its efforts to spread violence. We should not, and we will not, protect the Nicaraguan government from the anger of its own people. But we should, through diplomacy, offer an alternative. And as Nicaragua ponders its options, we can and will, with all the resources of diplomacy, protect each country of Central America from the danger of war. Even, even Costa Rica, Central America's oldest and strongest democracy, a government so peaceful it doesn't even have an army, is the object of bullying and threats from Nicaragua's dictators. Nicaragua's neighbors know that Sandinista promises of peace, non-alliance, and non-intervention have not been kept. Some 36 new military bases have been built. There were only 13 during the Somoza years. Nicaragua's new army numbers 25,000 men, supported by a militia of 50,000. It is the largest army in Central America, supplemented by 2,000 Cuban military and security advisors. 
It is equipped with the most modern weapons, dozens of Soviet-made tanks, 800 Soviet bloc trucks, Soviet 152 millimeter howitzers, 100 anti-aircraft guns, plus planes and helicopters. There are additional thousands of civilian advisors from Cuba, the Soviet Union, East Germany, Libya, and the PLO. And we're attacked because we have 55 military trainers in El Salvador. The goal of the professional guerrilla movements in Central America is as sim simple as it is sinister, to destabilize the entire region from the Panama Canal to Mexico. And if you doubt me on this point, just consider what Cayetano Carpio, the now deceased Salvadoran guerrilla leader said earlier this month. Carpio said that after El Salvador falls, El Salvador and Nicaragua would be arm in arm and struggling for the total liberation of Central America. Nicaragua's dictatorial junta, who themselves made war and won power operating from bases in Honduras and Costa Rica, like to pretend that they are today being attacked by forces based in Honduras. The fact is, it is Nicaragua's government that threatens Honduras, not the reverse. It is Nicaragua who has moved heavy tanks close to the border, and Nicaragua who speaks of war. It was Nicaraguan radio that announced on April 8th the creation of a new unified revolutionary coordinating board to push forward the Marxist struggle in Honduras. Nicaragua, supported by weapons and military resources provided by the communist bloc, represses its own people, refuses to make peace, and sponsors a guerrilla war against El Salvador. President Truman's words are as apt today as they were in 1947, when he too spoke before a joint session of the Congress. At the present moment in world history, nearly every nation must choose between alternative ways of life. The choice is not too often a free one. One way of life is based upon the will of the majority and is distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections, guarantees of individual liberty, freedom of speech and religion, and freedom from political oppression. The second way of life is based upon the will of a minority forcibly imposed upon the majority. It relies upon terror and oppression, a controlled press and radio, fixed elections, and the suppression of personal freedoms. I believe that it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. I believe that we must assist free peoples to work out their own destinies in their own way. I believe that our help should be primarily through economic and financial aid, which is essential to economic stability and orderly political processes. Collapse of free institutions and loss of independence would be disastrous not only for them, but for the world. Discouragement and possibly failure would quickly be the lot of neighboring peoples striving to maintain their freedom and independence. The countries of Central America are smaller than the nations that prompted President Truman's message. But the political and strategic stakes are the same. Will our response, economic, social, military, be as appropriate and successful as Mr. Truman's bold solutions to the problems of post-war Europe. Some people have forgotten the successes of those years and the details or decades of peace, prosperity, and freedom they secured. Some people talk as though the United States were incapable of acting effectively in international affairs without risking war or damaging those we seek to help. Are democracies required to remain passive while threats to their security and prosperity accumulate? Must we just accept the destabilization of an entire region from the Panama Canal to Mexico on our southern border? Must we sit by while independent nations of this hemisphere are integrated into the most aggressive empire the modern world has seen? Must we wait while Central Americans are driven from their homes like the more than a million who've sought refuge out of Afghanistan or the one and a half million who fled into China? or the more than a million Cubans who have fled Castro's Caribbean utopia? Must we, by default, leave the people of El Salvador no choice but to flee their homes, creating another tragic human exodus? 
I don't believe there's a majority in the Congress or the country that counsels passivity, resignation, defeatism in the face of this challenge to freedom and security in our own hemisphere. I do not believe that a majority of the Congress of the country is prepared to stand by passively while the people of Central America are delivered to totalitarianism and we ourselves are left vulnerable to new dangers. Only last week, an official of the Soviet Union reiterated Brezhnev's threat to station nuclear missiles in this hemisphere, five minutes from the United States. Like an echo, Nicaragua's Commandant Daniel Ortega confirmed that if asked his country would consider accepting those missiles. I understand that today they may be having second thoughts. Now, before I go any further, let me say to those who invoke the memory of Vietnam, there is no thought of sending American combat troops to Central America. They are not needed. <laughs> I say they are not needed, and indeed, they have not been requested there. All our neighbors ask of us is assistance in training and arms to protect themselves while they build a better, freer life. We must continue to encourage peace among the nations of Central America. We must support the regional efforts now underway to promote solutions to regional problems. We cannot be certain that the Marxist Leninist bands who believe war is an instrument of politics will be readily discouraged. It's crucial that we not become discouraged before they do. Otherwise, the region's freedom will be lost and our security damaged in ways that can hardly be calculated. If Central America were to fall, what would the consequences be for our position in Asia, Europe, and for alliances such as NATO? If the United States cannot respond to a threat near our own borders, why should Europeans or Asians believe that we're seriously concerned about threats to them? If the Soviets can assume that nothing short of an actual attack on the United States will provoke an American response, which ally, which friend will trust us then? The Congress shares both the power and the responsibility for our foreign policy. Tonight, I ask you, the Congress, to join me in a bold, generous approach to the problems of peace and poverty, democracy and dictatorship in the region. Join me in a program that prevents communist victory in the short run, but goes beyond to produce for the deprived people of the area the reality of present progress and the promise of more to come. Let us lay the foundation for a bipartisan approach to sustain the independence and freedom of the countries of Central America. We in the administration reach out to you in this spirit. We will pursue four basic goals in Central America. First, in response to decades of inequity and indifference, we will support democracy, reform, and human freedom. This means using our assistance, our powers of persuasion, and our legitimate leverage to bolster humane democratic systems where they already exist and to help countries on their way to that goal complete the process as quickly as human institutions can be changed. Elections in El Salvador and also in Nicaragua must be open to all, fair and safe. The international community must help. We will work at human rights problems, not walk away from them. Second, 
in response to the challenge of world recession, and in the case of El Salvador to the unrelenting campaign of economic sabotage by the guerrillas, we will support economic development. And by a margin of two to one, our aid is economic now, not military. 77 cents out of every dollar we will spend in the area this year goes for food, fertilizers, and other essentials for economic growth and development. And our economic program goes beyond traditional aid. The Caribbean Initiative, introduced in the House earlier today, will provide powerful trade and investment incentives to help these countries achieve self-sustaining economic growth without exporting U.S. jobs. Our goal must be to focus our immense and growing technology to enhance health care, agriculture, industry, and to ensure that we who inhabit this interdependent region come to know and understand each other better, retaining our diverse identities, respecting our diverse traditions and institutions. And third, in response to the military challenge from Cuba and Nicaragua, to their deliberate use of force to spread tyranny, we will support the security of the region's threatened nations. We do not view security assistance as an end in itself, but as a shield for democratization, economic development, and diplomacy. No amount of reform will bring peace so long as guerrillas believe they will win by force. No amount of economic help will suffice if guerrilla units can destroy roads and bridges and power stations and crops again and again with impunity. But with better training and material help, our neighbors can hold off the guerrillas and give democratic reform time to take root. And fourth, we will support dialogue and negotiations, both among the countries of the region and within each country. The terms and conditions of participation in elections are negotiable. Costa Rica is a shining example of democracy. Honduras has made the move from military rule to democratic government. Guatemala is pledged to the same course. The United States will work toward a political solution in Central America which will serve the interests of the democratic process. To To support these diplomatic goals, I offer these assurances. The United States will support any agreement among Central American countries for the withdrawal under fully verifiable and reciprocal conditions of all foreign military and security advisors and troops. We want to help opposition groups join the political process in all countries and compete by ballots instead of bullets. We will support any verifiable reciprocal agreement among Central American countries on the renunciation of support for insurgencies on neighbor's territory. And finally, we desire to help Central America end its costly arms race and will support any verifiable reciprocal agreements on the non-importation of offensive weapons. To move us toward these goals more rapidly, I am tonight announcing my intention to name an ambassador at large as my special envoy to Central America. He or she will report to me through the Secretary of State. The ambassador's responsibilities will be to lend U.S. support to the efforts of regional governments to bring peace to this troubled area and to work closely with the Congress to assure the fullest possible bipartisan coordination of our policies toward the region. What I'm asking for is prompt congressional approval for the full reprogramming of funds for key current economic and security programs so that the people of Central America can hold the line against externally supported aggression. In addition, I am asking for prompt action on the supplemental request in these same areas to carry us through the current fiscal year and for early and favorable congressional action on my request for fiscal year 1984. And finally, I am asking that the bipartisan consensus which last year acted on the trade and tax provisions of the Caribbean Basin initiatives in the House again take the lead to move this vital proposal to the floor of both chambers. And as I said before, the greatest share of these requests is targeted toward economic and humanitarian aid, not military. 
What the administration is asking for on behalf of freedom in Central America is so small, so minimal, considering what is at stake. The total amount requested for aid to all of Central America in 1984 is about $600 million. That's less than one-tenth of what Americans will spend this year on coin-operated video games. In summation, I say to you that tonight there can be no question the national security of all the Americas is at stake in Central America. If we cannot defend ourselves there, we cannot expect to prevail elsewhere. Our credibility would collapse, our alliances would crumble, and the safety of our homeland would be put in jeopardy. We have a vital interest, a moral duty, and a solemn responsibility. This is not a partisan issue. It is a question of our meeting our moral responsibility to ourselves, our friends, and our posterity. It is a duty that falls on all of us, the President, the Congress, and the people. We must perform it together. Who among us would wish to bear responsibility for failing to meet our shared obligation? Thank you. God bless you. Good night.